Hey everyone, it's Paul with a Tuesday YouTube video. And this week I want to continue going on where I started last week, which is that the same thing keeps happening in the markets, which is that we're getting this grinding, grinding sell off that just like, you know, we started like taking stocks here, stocks there. What is going on in this video? I'm going to tell you what in my judgment, in my opinion is happening. But before I do that, disclaimer time of this video and all of the content from my company, ATG Digital Media is not investment or financial advice. It is information, opinion, engagement, entertainment for those who find me hilarious. Past performance does not equal future results. We make errors, we make mistakes. There are oversights from time to time. Capital loss is a potential and likely outcome. And if you're following markets today, that probably is pretty clear, right? Yeah. I, the owners, contractors, employees, associates of ATG Digital Media, own trade, transact in the investments that are mentioned uh, in this video, in our updates, the model portfolios, uh, tweets, ball man speculating podcast, Talked about ATG Digital Media. Quick plug before I go on. If you want to check us out, atgdigital.media. Uh, paid subscriptions that start at $9.99. We focus on innovation. Why? Because in our opinion, this is the only thing that truly matters. And in hindsight, three years, five years from now will be the only thing that matters. Innovation, growth. So stocks and crypto. You get stock picks, updates, get a little flavor for that from the YouTube channel. And also, uh, yeah, I'll mention the Substack in a bit. Talk a bit about market strategy, commentary. And if you want to read some of this, you're watching some of it on YouTube. Uh, but if you want to read some of what our analysis, commentary, et cetera, et cetera, it sounds like, check out the Substack completely free at palmimpilly.substack.com. Huh. All right. So last week I told you like, hey, you know, this grinding sell off reminds me of bottoms in 2016 um, that, that we saw and in 2009. And that's the nature of bear markets, which is that bear markets, you tend to have stocks that will make sort of their bottoms one by one. In a crash, like what we experienced in 2020, you'll get a V return. And because it is a liquidity that is moving, price is higher, pretty much everything will go back up in price. But in a bear market, there is a sorting out process that is going on of like, where is the world going? And what is the impact on the value of this asset? not just purely liquidity. So now people start to really start to take into account the time frame. And what is being discussed today, and Dean, you can put up that headline about the 10-year bond, is the 10-year bond, the 10-year bond, and how high its yield is. Yield is just another word for interest rate, how high its yield is, and that it is back to where it was I mean, hard to believe back to 2007. So pre-2008 crash, pre-global financial crisis. If you bought a 10-year bond back then, yeah, you got a, a coupon rate of 4.8%. Now, you can put the other chart up, Dean, of the 10-year bond yield, and you will see that you know this... 10-year bond yield has been much higher and it has been lower. Like all the way in 2020, which is now just three years ago, it was essentially near zero. So why do people care about this 10-year bond and why should you care and why does it matter and what does it matter for the stocks? I focus on growth, innovation, opportunity, as I like to put it. Well, most serious investors and big investors use the interest rate associated uh, with the 10-year bond as the discount rate. What is this discount rate? In other words, how do you account for the time value of money? Because we know that inflation in the fiat-based system is inevitable. 
all right, governments by policy, by policy, uh, essentially are looking to reduce the value of the money that we have and own by a minimum of 2% every single year. So you, know, you have to discount future cash flows by something. You have to say like, well, hey, you know, uh, how do you account for that? So there's obviously a risk premium, which is, will I get my money back? Well, the one thing with this 10-year bond issued by our U.S. government is that since they can print money, you can always get your money back. But with inflation, you don't know what the value is in the future. So people use this 10-year yield as like this like proxy or benchmark or hurdle for pretty much pricing all assets. Since it is risk-free in the sense that well, the U.S. government is going to, you know, they're never going to default because they control the dollar. They can print as, many, as much of it as they want and return the money. So people consider it to be risk-free, really more appropriately default-free. But it doesn't account for the fact that uh, inflation is there. And it also doesn't account for the fact that when you uh, buy into whether it be a 10-year bond or anything else, there's a liquidity risk. There's, you know, this up and down, up and down stuff, and people want to be paid for their risk. So there's those three risks that are in there. And as a proxy, as a shortcut, a rule of thumb, if you will, people will just say, well, you know, let's just use the 10-year bond as our hurdle rate. In other words, you get paid for inflation, you get paid for liquidity risk. And, you know, we know that, like, you know, the default risk is effectively zero for this. So, when the 10-year bond rises, people start to price all the other assets. Um, I said 10-year bond rises. When the 10-year bond yield rises, people start to, you know, essentially start to haircut other assets and say, well, if I can get risk-free, if I can get some amount of inflation protection uh, and I know that the liquidity of the 10-year bond, you know, it does go up and down quite a bit. But uh, if, 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 you know, if that's a better deal than something that like, you know, let's say like some of these like companies that are growing at three and 4%. And uh, the only reason to own them is, you know, for example, their dividends or something like that. Would you really want to own it when you can get 4% in a default-free inflation taken care of, you know, liquidity, which is, you know, uh, always there for a 10-year bond. Um, yeah, people are going to, you know, say like, well, I don't think I really need to own, you know, whatever, General Mills, something like that. And equally, people are going to look at every asset and say, hey, well, if I can get 4.8%. I believe that's the that's the number. Dean, put put that chart up showing all of the different maturities of bonds. 4.8% for the 10-year bond. And that's let's just say, you know, like like the holding period that you should think about when you own stocks. I know nobody actually holds own stocks for 10 years. But nonetheless, that's the, you know, if you really want to get long-term returns associated with stock. 10 years is, is, is a good time frame to think, think within. You think if I'm not going to get 4.8% from my stock, from some asset, why do I own it? Why do I own it? I don't need to own it. And that thought process is what is being priced into markets. And why does it matter? Because literally two and a half years ago, the same interest rate was 0%. And if you use the same logic that I just laid out for you, which is that at 0%, okay, it wasn't zero, it was half a percent. The low in terms of the 10-year bond yield, which is the interest rate, was about zero, about 0.5%. So at 0.5%, I mean, virtually everything was a worthwhile risk because 0.5%, I mean, yeah, that return makes it not worthwhile to buy a 10-year bond, not worthwhile to save money in your savings account, which today is paying four and a half or five percent. So obviously interest rates have a big impact on investor behavior. 
In other words, now today with interest rates having normalized post the 2008 global financial crisis and the crash in 2008, they were very low for now in hindsight, we can say 13, 14 years. And now they've normalized and they've normalized in this very rapid period of time between September, October, 2021. And now Interest rates have gone from effectively like zero to five, six percent. Mortgage rates have gone from two to eight percent. In other words, we live in a world where interest rates are much higher than where they were two and a half years ago. And that's very tough for lots of different stocks, low growth stocks. These bond substitute stocks, for example, when interest rates were very low, lots of people bought into Stocks like General Mills and Kellogg and all these things that have very steady cash flows, very low growth. They don't have to reinvest a lot into their business because they spent really, you know, all of that money a long time ago. And those are sort of like cash flow businesses. And many people, because those dividends were high relative to interest rates, yeah, people own those and those stocks are being sold. Now, what about us? What about us? I mean, I'm just using that as an example. I'm not trying to beat down on those stocks. I know they're, they're popular stocks on many of you, but just explaining to you what that, how, what, how the market is behaving. What about our stocks? Now, I would tell you that for our stocks, it is growth that matters. It is the growth that matters because interest rates, while they are higher, higher than where they were two and a half years ago, if you go and Dean, put up that chart again, put up that chart of the 10 year bond, you'll see that relative to history, they're not crazy high. They've definitely been much higher. You can see, you know, go on, go on the, you know, uh, what, 1980s, you know, much higher. And from my research, from my study, the current rate of interest that we have, whatever, 4.8% of the 10-year bond, 5.5% for short-term bonds, this is not catastrophic for growth assets. Why? Because growth companies, I mean, to be considered a growth company, you got to grow at something like, I'd say, you know, in the current environment, I would say a minimum of like 8 to 10%. Uh, that, that's the minimum. I mean, that's not the maximum. That's a, you know, that's the minimum, 8 to 10%. So they're, they they jump the hurdle rate over the 10-year bond very easily. Oh, 4.8%, you know, if that's what you're looking at, you're like, well, I got to make at least 4.8%. And I know that stocks are riskier, so I want a little bit more than that. I can't just own 4.8%. I want at least double. Well, the only place you can actually get double in terms of business growth, in terms of returns, is a company that's got something that's different, uh, got something that's new that people, you know, demand and that can push their growth higher. And where in this current environment with interest rates being higher, it used to be zero. And I told you in that environment, people are willing to buy anything because the financial logic is you can buy anything. But with interest rates at 4.8%, there is one big difference in the market for growth stocks or even crypto, which is that the, the market investors and even me as a picker of stocks for the ATG digital model portfolios, we need to see that a company can sustain its growth internally. In other words, we don't want companies to put their hand out to us and say, hey, um, yeah, we need more money. And then we need more money again. And we need more money again. In, and in the period from like 2009 till 2022, companies could do that. Why? Because interest rates were so low that people were like, well, the opportunity cost is so low. It's 0.5% or it's 1%. Yeah, I'll take a chance on, you know, giving you money with the hope that, you know, the, your business and, and its stock will go up. Well, that is no longer true. The market wants to see growth stocks, innovation stocks, 
they got to show that they can sustain their growth from their internal business cash flow. And so for some companies that were subsidizing their customers um, by charging very low prices, yeah, they, they're going to have to like make some tough decisions, increase prices, which may disappear their growth, disappear their customers. Uh, they may have been carrying staff for various projects, which may be viable five or 10 years from now, but nonetheless, with interest rates higher, companies will have to make judgments and say, well, I can't get any more money for this particular project. Should I cut those, cut those projects off? So what it does is starts to really focus companies on what can generate sustainable growth, sustainable growth without requiring additional capital. And this is the sorting out process that is going on right now. And so if you go and look at the 52 week low list, which every day has had three or 400 stocks on it, which shows obviously a level of turmoil that is going on associated with the repricing of stocks, but it also shows people picking through the market, no different than any other market. People are going through things one by one and determining what, are the, what is the prospect for this business? What's the prospect for this company? Can they earn the hurdle rate that the new yield on the 10-year bond is setting, which is at 4.8%, maybe it goes to 4.9, maybe it goes to 5. Whatever it is, it has to earn a sufficient premium to make it worthwhile to own that stock. So very long explanation for what is going on. But nonetheless, I can say that in this market environment, one of the few things that can meet the hurdle rate of 4.8% or even 5%, truthfully, even 6% are companies that have some product or service that is very much in demand, which generates sufficient cash flow that they can invest back into their business, sustain their business, which then drives demand for their stock. Now, right now, of course, with sellers sort of in charge, nobody is going to be coming up and bidding prices higher. I mean, the 52 week high list, I think has 10 stocks today, maybe 12. So we will need like, you know, a, a small sifting out period to happen. But once that happens, it will be very clear which companies are setting up to thrive. And in my judgment it is going to be companies that are in the biggest trend for this era. And that is going to be artificial intelligence. That is going to be the big one. And if you want to check out our artificial intelligence stocks, we have a whole bunch in our introductory tier, uh, the silver tier at $9.99. We have more in our gold tier, uh, which uh, I believe goes for $14.99. So check those out. So bottom line, market update, a lot of 52-week lows, very few 52-week highs. Market is sifting out. Like the, the merchandise, if you will, trying to determine what is a company, what is a stock that can thrive and prosper in an era when interest rates are much higher. I believe that most of the companies that participate in the innovation and growth sort of sector, because they have something different and what they do creates more efficiency well, they are setting up to thrive and prosper in this period. All right, that's the video for today. If you like it, come back next week and I'll have another one. This is Paul saying bye.